Mr. Speaker, on Friday evening last, I received His Majesty's commission to form a new administration. It was the evident wish and will of Parliament and the nation that this should be conceived on the broadest possible basis and that it should include all parties, both those who supported the late government and also the parties of the opposition. I have completed the most important part of this task. A war cabinet has been formed of five members, representing with the liberal opposition the unity of the nation. The three party leaders have agreed to serve either in the war cabinet or in high executive office. The three fighting services have been filled. It was necessary that this could be done in one single day on account of the extreme urgency and rigor of events. A number of other key petitions were filled yesterday and I am submitting a further list to his majesty tonight. I hope to complete the appointment of the principal ministers during tomorrow. The appointment of the other ministers usually takes a little longer. But I trust that when Parliament meets again, this part of my task will be completed and that the administration will be complete in all respects. Sir, I considered it in the public interest to suggest that the House should be summoned to meet today. Mr. Speaker agreed and took the necessary steps in accordance with the powers conferred upon him by the resolution of the House. At the end of the proceedings today, the adjournment of the House will be proposed until Tuesday, the 21st of May, with, of course, provision for earlier meeting if need be. The business to be considered during that week will be notified to members at the earliest opportunity. I now invite the House, by the resolution which stands in my name, to record its approval of the steps taken and to declare its confidence in the new government. Sir, to form an administration of this scale and complexity is a serious undertaking in itself. But it must be remembered that we are in the preliminary stage of one of the greatest battles in history. That we are in action at many points in Norway and in Holland. That we have to be prepared in the Mediterranean. That the air battle is continuous. And so that many preparations have to be made here at home. In this crisis, I hope I may be pardoned if I do not address the House at any length today. I hope that any of my friends and colleagues or former colleagues who are affected by political reconstruction will make all allowances for any lack of ceremony with which it has been necessary to act. I would say to the House, as I said to those who have joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air. With all our might, with all the strength that God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous enemy never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory over long and hard the road may be. victory there is no survival. Let that be realized. No survival for the British Empire. No survival for all that the British Empire stood for. No survival for the urge and impulse of the ages that mankind will move forward towards its goal. But I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. This time I feel entitled to claim the aid of it. I say, come then, let us go forward.
forward together with our united strength. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at solicitation of Japan, still in conversation with its government and its emperor, looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleague delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. And while this reply stated that it seemed useless to continue the existing diplomatic negotiations. It contained no threat or hint of war or of armed attack. It will be recorded that the distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the intervening time, the Japanese government has deliberately sought to deceive the United States by false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The fact of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense, but always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us to 
overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Mr. Speaker, in the disastrous military events which have happened during the past fortnight have not come to me with any sense of surprise. Indeed, I indicated a fortnight ago, as clearly as I could to the House, that the worst possibilities were open. And I made it perfectly clear that whatever happened in France would make no difference to the resolve of Britain and the British Empire to fight on if necessary for years, if necessary alone. Mm, I have thought it right on this occasion to give the House and the country some indication of the solid practical ground upon which we base our inflexible resolve to continue the war. There are a good many people who say, never mind, win or lose, sink or swim, better die than submit to tyranny, and such a tyranny. And I do not dissociate myself from them. But I can assure them that our professional advisors of the three services unitedly advise that we should carry on the war and that there are good and reasonable hopes of final victory. We have fully informed and consulted all the self-governing dominions. These great communities, far beyond the oceans, who have been built up on our laws and on our civilization and who are absolutely free to choose their course, but are absolutely devoted to the ancient motherland and who feel themselves inspired by the same emotions which lead me to stake our all upon duty and honor. We do not yet know what will happen in France or whether the French resistance will be prolonged, both in France and in the French Empire of Vietnam. The French government will be throwing away great opportunities and casting adrift their future if they do not continue the war in accordance with their treaty obligations, from which we have not felt able to release it. The House will have read the historic declaration in which it was proclaimed our willingness at the darkest hour in French history to conclude a union of common citizenship in this struggle. However matters may go in France or with the French government or other French governments, we in the time of the French Empire will never lose our sense of comradeship with the French people. If we are now called upon to enjoy what they have been suffering, we shall emulate their courage. And if final victory rewards our toils, they shall share the gain. I and freedom shall be restored to all. We abate nothing of our just demands. Not one jot or tittle do we receive. Czechs, Poles, Norwegians, Dutch, Belgians have joined their forces to our own. All these shall be restored. What General Vagon calls the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. No fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free, and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, 
We'll sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted silence. Let us, therefore, brace ourselves to our duty. So bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. Подчинить 